Okay, so what we want to do today is we want to continue with our discussion from last time and talk about uh, the development of money. Uh, if you remember what we talked about last time was two functions performed by money. Money is a unit of account or we use, in the United States, we use the dollar as our unit of account and so we keep track of market values in dollars. And the other function performed by money is money is a medium of exchange. In the United States, we use the dollar as our medium of exchange, um, and meaning what? Meaning we use dollars in order to buy goods and services. The medium of exchange is the thing that we can hand over to people, and they will just accept it without saying, oh, do I want this? People know they want the dollar because they know that even if they have no personal use for it, they can spend it. Somebody else will accept it. Anyway, uh, what we did last time is we talked about this. We talked about what would happen in a barter economy, in an economy with no money, and then we saw some of the difficulties that would come up. In a barter economy with no unit of account, there are so many prices that it overwhelms the brain. We're not able to process prices. We're always getting bad deals on products, and it makes market activity, transactions, just undesirable if we can avoid it. Uh, without a medium of exchange, then we have to go a long ways to find a trading partner. We have to satisfy that double coincidence of wants requirement that we were talking about last time. Uh, that's difficult to do, so we have to look long and hard for a trading partner. And really what we said about both of these is that without money, uh, we face higher, or let's say just high, transactions cost. High cost of doing business with people. We're always confused about the value of things and we're looking a long ways to find a trading partner. So it's expensive to transact. Let me um, draw a supply and demand diagram. And this is really sort of a, a little bit of an addition to the supply and demand that we did earlier. Quantity of X. And I'm saying this is a little bit of an addition to what we did at the start of the semester. P, Q. Now, I didn't bring it up because everybody just assumed it and we didn't have to bring it up. And that is to say the subject of money. We just assumed everybody is using money. I'm going to put an M here. S, M, P, M, Q, M. This is the supply curve of good X, just a typical good, in an economy with money. This is the price that's established. This is the quantity that's established in the marketplace, the market clearing quantity. Anyway, suppose that we were to draw supply and demand for a barter economy. Now, I'm telling you that we already had money in the economy when we did this before, so I didn't make a point about, oh, this is a supply curve if there's money in the economy. Didn't make the point, but now I am. So if there's no money in the econ economy and we have barter, what do we face? And the answer is this supply curve here that we exists in a money economy, that refers to production costs. Production costs put the supply curve right there. But there are some additional costs, which we'll call transactions costs, if we had a barter economy. And so this curve would be higher. S B, that is to say, in a barter economy, there's production cost plus transactions cost. And those transactions costs cause that barter supply curve to lie higher than the money supply curve. And this, this additional amount in here, that's the transaction cost that goes on top of the production cost. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is, is that it's really not shifting the curve up. Really, in history, the barter supply curve came first. This was the original supply curve. It was, you don't just have to pay the cost of producing the good if you want to buy it, but you also have to find a trading partner and deal with the problems of not having a unit of account. So you really face these, um, these high costs and this SB curve in a barter economy. And so in the barter economy, there would be high prices and there will be a small quantity of goods and services available to consumers. We're, we're going to get fewer goods and services because we're burning up resources just looking for trading partners. 
trying to add up prices, trying to keep track of prices and so forth. So anyway, yeah, let me use the letter A and then, uh, no, not an A, let's use the letter B. This is the equilibrium in the barter economy, and here's the equilibrium situation in a money, carter, uh, money economy, it's point M. And what we can see then is that as we go from barter to money, transactions costs go down, and so we get a larger quantity of goods and services, and we're able to get those at a lower price. And so what I'm telling you here is, hey, if you get more goods and services at a lower price, that means that money increases the standard of living for people, market participants, you could say, people that are just out there buying and selling goods. So lowering transactions costs is an important thing. Uh, and let me just sort of go a little bit further. You can't really see any big amounts here. It's just QB, QM, PB, PM. And these are really vast differences between these quantities. I'm telling you that in a barter economy, that means poor. There's just few goods available. If I had to look and look and look and look to find somebody to trade with me, and think about this for just a second. I've got this degree in economics. That's the service I sell. You guys are my customers. If I had to go out in the morning and say, okay, I'm hungry, I want breakfast. I'm just gonna walk down the street and find somebody that will trade me bacon and eggs and toast for economics. Think about me. <laughs> this is a funny joke, isn't it? I go down the, door, uh, the street, I knock on the door, hey, want to trade bacon uh, a sandwich, uh, bacon, eggs, and what I say, toast, for economics. And they say, no, get out of here with that economics. I don't want to see any more of that around here. Don't even bring it back anymore. And I go, and I go, and I go. And I mean, how far do I have to go to find, find somebody who goes, yeah, economics, that's worth, uh, you know, what, the uh, bacon and egg and, and toast quite a ways. Now there are people that want economics, but man, maybe that's some bank in New York City or something. I got a long ways to go to find a trading partner. And so finally what I'd say is, man, I'm not eating very much. And then I would say, let's give up that economics thing. Let's do something else like raise chickens. Okay, slop the pigs. I'd just be living out on the farm someplace making breakfast because I couldn't find a trading partner. Now, there are people that want economics, but there's, most of the people who want economics don't have bacon and eggs and toast. They're like bankers, right? Or the government or somebody like that. And they go, yeah, come on in. And, and you know, if whatever it is they produce, that's what they try to give me. Oh, I read an article just a couple days ago, and it showed people coming home. This is over in Russia. They're coming home. They're working in a factory, and they're carrying bicycles. And so I think, well, that's interesting. Let me read that article. What was this? Oh, this was in Business Week. People coming home from work carrying bicycles. Why do they do this? Well, because there's no money there. And so when it's time to pay the workers, they just give them the merchandise that gets produced, bicycles. And so then the people go out and find somebody that will trade bicycles or want bicycles and will give them, like, gasoline for the car or food. So what I'm saying to you is if I take this thing I've got to sell and I've got to find a trading partner, the point is I would be extremely poor. I would not be able to find trading partners easily. And even if I did, I find somebody that's got bacon and eggs and toast, and then the next thing I want is a car. So now I've got to go down the road knocking on the door saying I've got economics for sale. Will you take me from point A to point B or will you give me your car? Yeah, right. Come on in. No, get out of here. I told you no bacon. I'm telling you now, no cars. So the point is, is that without money in the economy, we would be far poorer. These quantities would be a lot less available. Or conversely, money makes it possible for us to have a modern economy with a great deal of prosperity that's shared by all. Okay. The third function performed by money, and this will be the last one that we talk about, money is a store of value. And this is not the most important. It's really the third most important uh, function performed by money. Uh, money is a store of value. And all I mean by that is this. If you have some wealth that you'd like to store, you could hold money. Here's why that's not such a big deal. You could also hold stocks or bonds. You could own books. You could own land, diamonds, pearls, 
you name it. There's a lot of different forms of wealth that you could hold and store your, your value or store your wealth over time. And so money is only one of those. Money is pretty unique when it s starts serving these functions of unit of account and medium exchange. But money is not very unique when it comes to acting as a store of value. I have a little bit of money that I put away for retirement every month. I don't hold money as my store of value. What I do is I have that money go into the stock market. So I purchase stocks. I think money is not a very good store of value for longer periods of time. But on the other hand, if uh, you know, you're know you just going to spend money over the next week or so, sure, I'll go and get 50 or $100 in cash out of the bank and walk around with it. And, and I've got a store of value, 50 or $100 in my pocket, and I'll spend that through the week. But what I'm saying is for very large amounts of money and for a very long period of time, money is not such a special store of value. Those people in Russia that I was talking about a moment ago, they will get rid of their money just as soon as they can because prices are going up. And when there's inflation, well, think of, about the, uh, of it this way. We'll deal with inflation here. Talk about dollars at first. Suppose I've got a dollar in my pocket, and I go over to McDonald's hamburgers, and I say, hey, how much for a cheeseburger? And they say, one dollar. Then I think, that one dollar in my pocket, that equals one dollar. We've talked about this before when it was the real balance effect that we discussed. I've got a dollar in my pocket, I can trade that for a hamburger. If there's inflation, if prices go up, I go back the next day, I say, how much for a hamburger? They say, two dollars. And I say, wow, I've got that same one dollar in my pocket, but I'll only buy half a hamburger now. I've, that dollar lost half of its purchasing power. So what I'm saying to you is that money as a store of value, you walking around holding your wealth in your pocket and prices go up, the value of what you've got in your pocket, it's the same size as before, but its purchasing power has gone down really inverse to the price level increase. And so money is not a great store of value. And in Russia and in some other countries, what they do is they get rid of their money as soon as they can, their currency, because they know prices are going up and the value of that currency is going down. What do they do in Russia? And the answer is well, they like to hold dollars as a store of value. Now, as a medium of exchange or a unit of account, they're walking around the street spending money. They're spending their own money. But when it's a store of value and they want to save money, they'll hold dollars or some other asset instead. Anyway. These are functions performed by money. And the reason we've talked about these is these things that money does, that's why money developed. Without these things, there were high transactions costs, particularly from number one and number two, and that made life inconvenient. And nobody set out to say, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to invent some money. This is not like blue salt or something like that you just throw together, you know, at a moment's notice. Uh, if you're going to invent money, this is, I mean, this takes a long period of time. No single person invented it. It developed in the marketplace. People just started keeping track in terms of silver. And, and nobody thought, oh, this will lower transactions costs. They just said, this will make my life more convenient. And so individuals making their own lives more convenient, they develop money. It was not developed by government. It was developed before government, independent of government. Okay? Now, what I'll tell you is this. There are other desirable characteristics of money. Money must do these first three things, perform those functions, or else there won't be money. On the other hand, there are different kinds of money. There's not just one kind of money. It's not just that dollar bill in your pocket. There's checking account money, for example. Okay. So there are other forms of money, and all forms of money need to perform these functions. But then when we start choosing, do I want this kind of money or that kind of money, then these other desirable characteristics uh, play a role. Let me just tick off a few of these. Uh, money needs to be portable. It needs to be durable. It needs to be, let's see, limited in quantity. It needs to be, well, it doesn't need to be, but it's desirable, interest-bearing. We could add to the list. Maybe you can think of some things to add to the list. But the point is, uh, and let me just talk about these briefly. Portable, it needs to be something you can move around easily. 
<laughs> you know, there are forms of money. I drew that picture last time of that big round rock with a hole in it where they'd put a stick through it and pick it up and carry it. Those things weigh, some of them weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And so what happens is you take that form of money and you lean it up against a tree or something like that and never move it. Okay, uh, I told you about money on that island of Yap. That was um, uh, over in the Pacific, and that's limestone rock. And what people would do there is they would say, oh, you see that rock there? I want to buy uh, like a cow from you. And the person would say, okay. And then you say, that rock money is yours. And the person would say, okay. And then they would just leave it there and not move it. And then they would go around and say, oh, I want to buy, you know, like three sheep and uh, two goats from you. And that rock money is yours, and we'll just leave it there. And that money is too heavy to move. But that's okay on a small island in the Pacific where you move, where would you go? Just 100 feet over there and you're in the ocean. But in the United States, we need to be able to move this stuff around. It's got to be portable, durable. We don't want it to be wearing out in a few minutes. I told you, I think I told you the other day that in uh, the Carolinas and in Virginia and so forth back uh, 200 years ago, they would use uh, tobacco leaves as money oftentimes. Well, tobacco leaves are not durable. They, get, they dry out and then they start getting crumbly and before you know it, they're on the ground and you're scooping up dirt with tobacco leaves mixed in. No, we want durable. You would not believe, unless you're already aware of it, how durable a dollar bill is. Before a dollar bill can ever get produced, it goes through tests, very rigorous tests, and they do all sorts of things like put it in a washing machine, run it through there 20 or 30 times, roll it up into a little cylinder, and then take a hammer and just hit it as hard as they can and see if they can beat it down to nothing. And when they do, they're looking to see, does all the ink fall off, and where that this doesn't look like money anymore. Those dollar bills that we have are durable. They last. Limited in quantity. If there's no limit to the quantity, suppose somebody just says, oh, well, you've all heard the expression about money doesn't grow on trees. What if it does? What if a leaf was money? Well, there's really not an, uh, not an unlimited quantity of leaves, but trillions and trillions of them, a lot of leaves. And so if there was no limit on the quantity of money, then in order to buy a loaf of bread, you'd need like, you know, maybe a dump truck full of leaves. Prices would just go up and up because there would be a huge quantity of money. Limiting the quantity of money, and by the way, uh, we've got sort of a fallacy of composition here. I don't want my quantity of money to be limited. You don't want your quantity to be limited. I'm saying I want the total quantity to be limited. I'd like the money supply to stay, the total, right where it is today, but I just want a bigger chunk of it. So there's a fallacy of composition. What's true for the whole is not true for the parts. We want our, our money supply to be unlimited individually, but we want the total to be limited. We don't want aggregate demand to grow without bound because then prices would go up without bound. Interest bearing, gosh, that is something that I always dreamed of back in the old days. And then finally, um, I'm saying back in the old days, the Federal Reserve and other regulatory agencies of the government, they said banks cannot pay interest on checking accounts. And I thought, I want interest on my checking account. Well, now they pay it. But the point is, is that if they start paying interest on some form of money, we want that more than we did before. So anyway, really what I'm telling you is all forms of money must perform these basic functions, but then when we decide, do I want to carry cash? Do I want to carry an ATM card? Do I want to carry a checkbook? Do I want this? Do I want that? We start thinking about some of these characteristics and the forms of money that are most desirable for our own point of view. That's what we use. Some newer desirable characteristics uh, we can also list. How about this? Access. Any time, any place. Boy, isn't that great? If you could leave the money in your bank and then just snap your fingers and it's right there in your hand whenever you want it, wouldn't that be great? Just instant access. Well, you know those, um, those cards that you have, like a debit card? Well, that might allow you to have that access anytime, anyplace, or practically anytime, anyplace, or an ATM card. Here's another thing that people want in modern times from their money, anonymity. Hey, I wonder if I'm spelling that right. Could be. Anonymous. You know, once we start using all this electronic money, then there's a computer someplace that's got your name on it, and they know every place you're going and spending that money. Right? If you're out at the Blockbuster renting some kind of racy movie, then there's some computer that someplace knows that, oh, Tom is using his electric money, electronic money, in order to, buy the, or to rent this racy movie. That'll count against me if I ever try to get on the Supreme Court. Um, 
Anyway, so these are other concerns. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are lots of things that, um, oh, you know, there's one I did not write down here. Uniform. I thought I wrote that down. Uh, we want our money to be uniform. We want it to look the same. D maybe you don't know this, but when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, there were over 10,000 different kinds of money in the United States. 10,000 different kinds of money. Each bank could issue its own currency, put, you know, like the banker's grand granddaughter's picture on the, the bill, uh, $13 bills, uh, I mean, just whatever you want to put on them. I'm not saying there was somebody that did that. I'm making this part up about the granddaughter and the $13. But 10,000 different forms of money. So if you go into a store and you pull some money out and say, hey, I want to buy some merchandise, then what they would do is they will look at that money and say, man, I don't recognize that. Where'd you get that stuff? Oh, I got a, you know two towns down the road and make a right turn, and there's a bank down there out in the country, and they issued that. You know, I don't think I'm going to be accepting that. I swear it's good. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Then why don't you just go over to the bank and trade that in for some money that we recognize? Anyway, the point is, is that we want our money to be uniform so we can recognize it. We don't have to spend a lot of time wondering. If we have to spend time wondering, is that good? Then we're back into the world of high transactions costs. If there's thousands of kinds of money, there's really no kind of money. So anyway, um, so these are some of the old standby desirable characteristics. There are others that we could have for sort of modern times. Um, the important thing that we recognize is that money is always changing. Money is changing. Why is it changing? And the answer is, you know, for the same reason that cars change. Customers say, hey, I want them side airbags on the car, or I want that CD player in the car, or I want that GPS system in the car so that a voice can come on and tell me that I'm lost. Make a right turn and you'll be back on the road again. Why do people want those things on the car? It makes life a little more convenient. It's worth it. I'm willing to spend the extra thousand dollars for that accessory or whatever. And so it's the same thing with money. Hey, this kind of money I'm carrying, it doesn't do it all for me. There's some inconveniences I'm facing. I'd like to be able to buy things on the internet. And these kinds of money I have right now, I can't buy things on the internet. Come up with some new form of money. And there's some entrepreneur out there and the wheels are turning going, you know, if I do this or I do that, people would start using my kind of money for internet commerce. And so money is changing because entrepreneurs are coming up with new, more convenient forms of money that have more desirable characteristics than the existing forms of money. And that being the case, there will always be new kinds of money or new twists on old money. The idea of, of money is not new. We talked about these functions performed by money. I was telling you the story of uh, those functions developing gradually back in Sumer 2000 BC, but coins developed in Lydia in 640 BC. That is to say, the first coin, the first thing somebody says, this is money. Not just that, oh yeah, we use the silver as the unit of account and we've got two or three things as a medium of exchange and so forth, but when somebody finally made the sort of circular object out of, this is actually called electrum, which was gold plus silver. Oh, and by the way, Lydia, this is now what we would say Turkey. It's over at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, just south of Greece. Anyway, in about 640 BC, that's the first time somebody took this little disc, flattened it out, and made it into something like we would say, hey, look at that coin. And it was made of, they called it electrum, which was really just a combination of gold and silver. This was uh, alluvial gold. It came uh, washing down the river stream out of the mountains. Uh, what they have over in that part of the world is a lot of volcanic action. The volcanoes are throwing up. It sort of cooks the gold and silver underneath the Earth's uh, surface and then throws it up and there's gold and silver out there and then the water comes along from the rainfall and the melting um, snow and so forth and starts bringing that gold and silver downstream and so there were people just hanging around down there and they said, oh, look at this, gold and silver. And so they started making those coins out of it. 
640 BC. And you know, in about 20, 25 years, the Greeks said, oh, that's a great idea. And so they just adopted it. They were just a few miles away. And in fact, in those days, it would hard be difficult to know if a person lived in Turkey or Greece in terms of looking at the person or their language. It was all just right there together. They were trading with each other. But the Greeks saw these coins, and they said, that's a neat idea. And about 20, 25 years later, and there were a lot of different Greek cities making a lot of different coins. N uh, not the cities, but really merchants living in those cities. This was a private activity. Some individual merchant said, oh, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to stamp these out. I'll take them out and trade them for goods. I'll always accept them back for my merchandise. And then after a while, some king that was living in the neighborhood, he says, man, you know what you need is you need my picture on there. So the king starts printing his own uh, coins up. The first coins did not have a person's face on them. Really all they did is had the shape and then they had a punch right here in the center, bam. And that punch would just sort of, that was the mark that this, uh, this guy was making on his coins. But anyway, before very long, just a few years, they started putting king's names on. And by the way, most of us have heard these stories about King Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. This is right over in that same part of the world. King Midas was the king of I don't think he was the king of Lydia, but the country right next door, small countries. And uh, so he was around at the same time when uh, the first money was being developed. And then, of course, it was the Greeks that would tell those stories of King Midas and so forth. Anyway, so those are the first coins. 640 BC, it was about 300, what would it be, 310 years later, uh, about 330 BC, where Alexander the Great. Alex the Great. <sighs> Alexander the Great was from where we would say is Greece now. Alexander the Great had seen these coins in, from Lydia. He had seen coins that other Greeks made. And so he was familiar with the idea. And we're saying that coins were really just circulating in a small area of the world. Turkey, Greece, and then whoever they traded with within 50 or 100 or 200 miles, but right there in that little area. So along comes Alexander the Great later on. He's seen all these coins that are just circulating in a small area. You know, if I were like a good artist, <laughs> yeah, if I were a good artist, let's see if I can, is that what Italy looks like? Somehow or another. There's the Mediterranean world. This is Europe. <laughs> I'm expecting a certain amount of uh, respect for my artwork. So anyway, uh, here's the Mediterranean. Here's the uh, Straits of Gibraltar right there. Here's the uh, Atlantic. Okay, and I'm saying that right over here is Greece, and right here is Turkey. There's some straits going through here. There's a little bit of water and so forth. But anyway, in the early years, there's just money in this small area around here. But from up in here, here comes Alexander the Great. He goes over and conquers some major cities and finds vast amounts of gold. And so he takes that gold and he melts it down, has it melted down, making coins. Put my picture on it. And so anyway, they stamped lots and lots and lots of coins. And I'm talking about really tens of thousands of these coins. And then Alexander the Great, he goes all the way to India and conquers territory. And not him, but some of his generals and so forth. They're over here in uh, Europe. And so really, it was Alexander the Great that took this idea of coinage that developed in Lydia. And about 300 years later, spread the idea all the way from the Atlantic coast to India, down into Africa, into the Middle East, up into this area around the Black Sea. Money was a common thing by 330 BC and never to be forgotten again. It was Alexander the Great that spread the idea. The second form of money that everybody's familiar with is paper money. When did paper money develop? Paper currency. China, about 900 AD. Wow, 1,500 years later. After the coins were developed, it was 1,500 years before there's paper money. And why did it take so long? And the answer is, well, first of all, somebody had to invent paper. You know, that's one of the holdbacks there. If you want to create paper money, you need paper. And then they also needed this movable type, some way of printing. And so in China, they developed these techniques and started printing uh, paper currency back in about 900. And they said, wow, this is fabulous. We no longer need gold and silver. We can just make this stuff at home. What they did 
is they printed too much. So they didn't have a limited quantity. They created runaway inflation and really destroyed their economy. So they stopped doing that, but then they came back in three or four hundred years and did it again and destroyed their economy again. But the point is, this is where this developed. Then the third kind of money that we're familiar with is bank deposit money. Uh, and I'll give you three examples of this. One is in Venice, uh, Florence, and Genoa, Italy. In about, oh, I don't know, 1100 to 1300 AD. Here what we were dealing with is money changers. Each Italian city was independent of the others. Each one was kind of a small nation in itself. And so each of these cities in Italy and others, they would create their own money. Like in Florence, they had the Florin. And in Venice, the Ducat, D-U-C-A-T. So anyway, each one of these cities had its own sort of money. So in any marketplace, what would happen is there would be a money changer there who was just sitting around with a bench sitting there at the bench and saying, uh, you people can bring me up here any form of money you want and I'll trade and give you another form of money. And he charged a little bit for his service, but he was a money changer. And you know, if you're doing business with business people, then you don't just have a few dollars sitting, or you know, a few ducats or whatever sitting here on the bench. What you have to have is a lot. So the money changer says, man, I'm needing a lot of money. And so then the money changer starts saying to people, hey, uh, and, and I'm not saying the people who want to change their money, just private individuals. Hey, if you've got any money you would like to leave with me, I'll add it to my holdings down here at the bench, and that way I can do more business money changing and I'll pay you something for the use of your money. And so people started coming down and leaving their money with the money changer in order to get a payment. Uh, you know, like, yeah, I'll rent you my money and you can use that in your business. And so after a while, this becomes kind of a regular thing. People come down to the money changer, you can rent my money, have it for a while. Money changer pay interest on that or a fee. And all of a sudden, this has really become a deposit form of money. After a while, you come to the money changer, you say, hey, I need to buy something up in you know, Paris or someplace like that. And the money changer would say, no problem, I'll fill out this uh, receipt for you, and you can take that to Paris, and they will honor it up there. And so we're getting a deposit. We're leaving the money with the money changer. We're getting paid a little interest, and we can take that money changer's receipt and, and spend it. A second example um, that we'll talk about is in England, the goldsmiths. And this is in about 1600 AD. Okay, here's what happened in England. There were people called goldsmiths. They were just craftsmen that worked with gold just like we have silversmiths, uh, leathersmiths, if you've never heard that term, it's somebody that works with leather. The smith means that's a craftsman that works on gold. A blacksmith is a craftsman that works with iron. Okay, but anyway, in England they had goldsmiths and these guys were familiar with gold and since they worked with gold all the time, they'd have to have a vault and store their gold. And so what happened in England is people would come in and they'd say, hey, could you hold this gold for me? And uh, Goldsmith would say, okay, and just as a favor. But after a while, the Goldsmith said, man, a lot of people are coming to me saying, will you hold this gold? And so the Goldsmith started charging a small fee. But the point is, is that the Goldsmith would take your gold, put it in the vault, and then, of course, give you a receipt, which we call a warehouse receipt. But give you a receipt. And then what people started doing, didn't do it overnight, but they started going around and using those warehouse receipts to buy something. Yeah, there's gold back in the vault, but you could go to somebody and say, hey, this warehouse receipt's worth 10 ounces of gold. Would you sell me like that horse and wagon? And a person would go, yeah, and they would just take the receipt. Why? Well, because it's really, it's a lot less heavy. It's easier to store. You could put your money with the goldsmith, and after a while, the goldsmith will pay you interest for it because the goldsmith wants more gold coming in. He's going to start lending that gold out, and he'll charge interest, so he'll pay a little bit. But the point is, is that, and by the way, you see the word bank. We're really talking about the development of banking. 
right? I'm saying these money changers and these goldsmiths are going to turn into bank, bankers later on, but in this early stage, all they're doing is taking a deposit and giving you back a receipt. And I'm saying that receipt started being used as money later on. In the United States, from 1789, that's when the United States Constitution took effect. So that's really when it became a separate nation. From 1789, we have had banks that would take deposits. What they did in the early days in the United States, they would take your deposit of gold or silver or something like that and give you back currency which they had created, their own paper money. Okay. Later on, at about the time of the Civil War, that, that currency that bankers had been handing out since 1789, and that currency got taxed and bankers had to stop passing that stuff out. For the first time, at the time in the Civil War, we got a national uniform currency. But anyway, the point is, is that at the time of the Civil War, these bankers, they would take your deposit, but no longer could they issue their own currency. But what bankers started doing at this time is they started handing you out a checkbook and saying, oh, here, you can write a check on your account. Okay, so these are the, the main forms of money. Let me just mention um, EFTS, Electronic Funds Transfer Services. EFTS and, and Electronic Funds Transfer Service. You're more, um, you know more about um, an ATM card, so this is electronic money. You can transfer dollars electronically through an ATM machine. We've got direct deposit, D, uh, my spelling's bad, direct deposit of your paycheck, for example. Maybe your paycheck goes directly into the bank. That's electronic funds transfer service. It's transferring from your employer's bank account to your bank account. Uh, how about this bill paying service? City Utilities told me a few months back, hey, you give us one of your checks, a voided check, we'll get all the information off of it, and then every month, rather than you having to pay your utility bill, we'll just automatically debit your checking account at the bank, and your bill's paid. And that's three examples of electronic fund transfers. This is really since, what, uh, 1960s? And we seem to be going into one additional stage now, which is really, uh, I'll say, internet, uh, online money. And there are some internet or online forms of money, but that's not fully developed yet. And we don't know how that's all going to work its way out. But anyway, this is sort of an evolution of money where we started off with the coins and work our way all the way down to modern times. And you can see that there's been a lot of changes through the years, and really more than I've shown you now. Well, we'll stop for the day with that, and uh, we'll pick up with that next time. So long.